Welcome back all, Dr. JC here, part two, lecture six. In this part, we're going to take a few minutes to talk about four select isms, romanticism, nationalism, conservatism, and liberalism. Not just to kind of try to understand what the devil these isms were all about, but how they may have impacted social thought and, more importantly, action. Now, as we've already seen at the end of part one, that surely Romanticism is going to have an impact on the revolutions of 1830, part of the reason, again, why they called those the Romantic Revolutions. But more generally, how these isms also spread across the globe, most especially in the Western world. So let's start first with Romanticism. Romanticism started in the end of the 1700s, really took off uh, roughly about 1800 to 1850, not just in Europe, but in the Western world more generally speaking. I mean, there was a big movement here in the United States as well. And as indicated here on the slide, it was in some sense a reaction to the Descartes version of rationalism. The idea, as posited in the scientific revolution, that all things in nature, all things in life, can be understood and ordered through the application and use of reason. That if we put together the right zeros and ones and create those algorithms, then we just need to hit play and everything's fine. We understand how things work. We can control how they work. Romantics, however, moved in a different direction. They said, yeah, we get that. The use of the head makes sense. But what about the heart? And more importantly, what about abstractions? How do you measure an abstraction? Show me the algorithm, they might say, that can specifically let others know the level of anxiety I'm feeling, the level of joy I'm feeling, the level of anger I'm feeling, the level of pure ecstasy I might be feeling, you can't do that. In fact, you can't even do it in the animal world. You can't tell me 100% of the time exactly how that crow is going to come out of the tree, what that peregrine falcon is going to dive on for prey on Thursday afternoon versus Friday afternoon. You can't do it. There's some things that zeros and ones can't touch, and therefore intuition in the heart truly matters. In fact, maybe the use of the heart more would produce better results, a more stable social order or society. Romantics, in many ways, viewed the glass as half full, that most people are hardwired to do good and be good. Almost the opposite of Machiavelli, in a way. And if people are hardwired to do good and be good, don't try to constrict their thought and action. Get out of the way of it. Because if they're hardwired to do good, they're wanting to do good not just for themselves, but for their society, their county, their state, their country. And maybe the best way for a king to advance his flag is to recognize that people are citizens, not subjects. This is not necessarily meant to imply that romantics all thought everyone is entirely equal. That's not entirely true. They would, though, however, lead the fight in what we might call pursuit of social justice. These are individuals that would be abolitionists, individuals out fighting against the institution of slavery, individuals pushing for women to have a greater role in society, that perhaps some of the inequities that were beginning to emerge in the Industrial Revolution, where a few individuals are beginning to amass all sorts of coin and the vast majority don't have much, looking for ways to sort of bridge that gap as well. So in some sense, these were individuals that were much more driven by abstractions themselves, like equality, over, per se, the accumulation of wealth. Hence, mentioned here on the slide, the notion of idealism over materialism. Therefore, whatever the medium might be, writing, music, painting, sculpture, whatever that might be, however one conveys a message in words, images, whatever it might be, Romantics did bring a sense of hope, that there is hope for the future, and that passion and emotion matters. Now, can some people get too passionate and too emotional? For sure. And there'll be other isms that come behind that as ways to perhaps check excessive uses of passion and emotion. But for all intents and purposes, Romantics would say passion, emotion, the heart, they're good things. And the more we have of that, the better for all, to include king and country. 
As an extension of this romantic movement, it could be applied to nations and nation states, a people more generally. And we see this in another ism that emerges, nationalism. Largely advanced and prescribed by Johann Gottfried Herder, also known as the father of modern nationalism, Herder would say, look, just as there is a zeitgeist, a spirit of an age, there is also a Volksgeist, a spirit of the people. And the spirit of the people can be represented by a flag or national emblem. It represents in many ways who they are as a people, and they ought to be celebrated as a people. Therefore, if there is a group of individuals, ethnically alike, culturally alike, they ought to have the ability to go ahead and create their own nation, create their own state, create their own flag, and celebrate that. Just as this idea of celebrating the individual emerges in the Renaissance, why can't we also celebrate, says Herder, the collective individual that might be a people? And therefore, nationalism's a good thing, because it's a celebration of what and who we are as a people. And therefore, nationalists and romantics alike might say to the Metternichs of the world, sorry, I get you guys want to do balance of power in Europe. But the best way to balance power in Europe is not to slam people that are ethnically, culturally, or spiritually different from one another together and tell them to get along. Wrong answer. The best way to go about creating order is to allow individuals or groups of individuals to come together, create, innovate, and rise Therefore, it doesn't matter the size of the community. If they want to come together and form their own nation, all the other nations in the world, the community of nations, the international body of nations, should welcome more flags rather than look to put someone else's flag down underneath your flag. Thus, at the end of the day, romantics and nationalists aren't that different. Just as romantics want to push for social justice, think of nationalists pushing for this for entire communities, that there should be a degree of equity amongst neighbors, and it doesn't matter the size of your country, that all peoples are different, they're unique, and all of them can, can contribute in a positive way, if free to do so, and if not threatened. Now, there's going to be another set of folks that are out there in Europe, maybe a little bit more practical and pragmatic in their view. Maybe they do, in some sense, recognize, yeah, most people are hardware to be pretty good. But you know what? There's some real POSs out there as well in society. And sometimes it's whole groups of people, all right? So I understand in some ways what you romantics and nationalists, at least nationalists from the Johann Gottfried Herder brand are saying. And as much as I'd love to join your inner circle of love, right? I ain't drinking your Kool-Aid, bro. And let me tell you why. Because it's all ideological fluff, and let me tell you why I think that way. It's ideological fluff because the average person is always going to complain about something. They just are. They're not going to be happy. They work too many hours. They don't have enough money. Their porridge isn't the right temperature. Look at the French Revolution, conservatives would say. That was the common man. And what did the common man do? Chop off the heads of lots of other common men. Ooh, isn't that lovely? Let me join that clique. Hey, look, honey, there's a new social club forming. The radical Frenchman. Doesn't that sound cool? And, and and there's even it says BYOG to the next meeting. Bring your own guillotine. Wonderful. Seriously? No. Ultimately what people need is structure and order. That's what they need. Because too much individualism espoused all the way back from the Renaissance and now hammered home by romantics and even these liberals to the left has done what? Created too much me, myself, and I. And as a result of this excessive individualism, the Volksgeist or national spirit has suffered, and more importantly, the Volksgemeinschaft, or people's community here, has suffered. That the individual has placed themselves ahead of everything else, whether it's their community, or most importantly, their state. And therefore, this is unacceptable. And an important point there, putting yourself before your state, conservatives will begin to align with more militant 
wings of the nationalist party and those that would prescribe nationalism and i want you to put that in the back of your mind because when we start to talk about various causes of world war one in future weeks one of the causes is nationalism and it'll be a different brand of nationalism than the one prescribed by johann gottfried herder it will be one that blends more of these conservative principles with militant nationalism keep that in the back of your mind for when we move forward but who are these liberals that the conservatives had some problem with? Let's finish this part of the lecture with them next. It's worth noting here, first and foremost, that when we're talking about 19th century liberalism, I don't want you guys to misconfuse this with modern political parlance. As there'd be folks on the conservative right today that would say, oh, good God, these frickin' left-wing loons. Holy hell, right? No, that's a different form of liberal. They're referring to ultra-progressives and borderline Marxists, all right? That's not the case here. I want you to focus on 19th century liberalism, and I'll highlight a couple key aspects of what that means listed here on this slide. While these four here are hardly an exhaustive list, I do think they capture pretty well the spirit of 19th century liberalism. And in fact, hearkening back to what I was just talking about a minute ago about not mixing terms, if you were to apply these four to Americans today, hell, you'd probably get conservatives and, and liberals slash progressives alike that agree with these principles. So it's always important to understand the context and the time period as it relates to specific terminology. And in viewing these four here, the idea that the individual matters, they are self-sufficient beings, that freedom matters, economic individualism matters, that individuals have specific certain inalienable rights, and they are probably best preserved by a constant Constitution, which can limit power, not just of an all-powerful prince, but of an all-powerful people as well. That there's a good middle ground here, maybe. You can see how in some ways, perhaps many ways, why it was so hard for conservatives to have their message heard and or win out in this age, largely because the common man, the common woman, is going to latch on to these types of principles. They just are. So the question moving forward, then, is how is it that individuals imbued with this sense of individualism, with this sense of purpose, going all the way back to the Renaissance in many ways, how did they turn from a more self-focus to a much more militant national focus that we're going to see at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s and spill over all the way in toward the middle of the 1900s? That's the question we'll take up in weeks ahead. And thus, as we conclude part two on these various isms here, we will pivot next in part three, the last part of lecture six here, to the unification movements in Italy and Germany. And we'll begin to start to see in these unification movements some of this movement from the individual to the more militant national as well. Dr. JC out, part two here. Head to part three next. See you on the other side.